Hi guys, in this video we are going to look into Markov chains, the backbone of the MCMC algorithm. And our journey begins with the question of free will. So in the 19th century, statistics unexpectedly entered the realm of religious and philosophical debate. Many believers in God also believed in free will, while many seculars leaned towards determinism. Yet statistics seemed to challenge the very notion of free will. And why is that? Well, because scholars began to notice that social data displayed astonishing regularity from year to year. So here, for example, you can see statistics on the number of marriages in which the groom was under 30, broken down by the bride's age across five consecutive years. So the patterns are strikingly stable. And so the terminists, such as the English historian Henry Thomas Buckle, argued that if free will exists, how do we explain these regularities? How do we explain that crime rates in a given year are more or less the same, or marriages are more or less the same? On the other hand, advocates of free will, like the Belgian astronomer and statistician Adolf Kutle, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, responded that while statistics reveal tendencies in the collective behavior, they do not predetermine individual actions, and therefore cannot be taken as evidence of determinism. Now, at the time, the law of large numbers was already known. In broad terms, what the law of large numbers says is that if you take the average of independent samples from a distribution, that average will converge to the true mean of the distribution. The Russian theologian and mathematician Pavel Nekrasov was a defender of free will, and he interpreted this law as proof of its existence. His reasoning went like this. If independence is essentially the same as free will, and if independence is required for the law of large numbers, then since the law of large numbers is observed everywhere in nature and society, what better proof can we ask for? And so in a paper that he published in 1898, he even offered a proof of one version of the law of large numbers. However, he made a mistake and he accidentally claimed that independence is a necessary condition. Today, we know that independence is a sufficient condition, but not a necessary one. And how do we know this? Well, thanks to the Russian mathematician Andrei Markov. He came up with dependent samples that nonetheless abided by the law of large numbers. His famous example became known as the first Markov chain. Now there's this urban legend going around that he mentions free will in his paper on the topic, but actually he concludes his paper with the quote, so the independence of variables is not a necessary condition for the validity of the law of large numbers. Now it also should be noted that there are many flavors of the law of large numbers. And here you can see a partial development of the proofs to different scenarios. And Nekrasov has a place in this list, but because he was a Tsarist, meaning supporter of the Tsar and the status quo, he was on the losing political side and during the revolution he got at first ridiculed and marginalized, but later completely erased from the history. And that was until the fall of the Soviet Union. Okay, so that was the history part, but let's move to the actual math. So what is exactly a Markov chain? To define one, we need two main ingredients. One is a state space, meaning a set of all possible states. And the second is a transition probability that describes the chance of moving from one state to another or the probability of moving from one state to another. Now, the key feature in Markov chains is what is called the Markov property. And what it says is that the probability of moving to the next state depends only on the current state and not on the entire history of states that came before it. And this kind of process is called first order Markov chains, but there's also higher order Markov chains. For example, the second order Markov chain depends not only on the current state, but also on the previous state. But we won't get into this in this video. So one famous Markov chain that Markov presented in 1913 had vowels and consonants as the state space and it calculated the transition probability based on Pushkin's rhymed novel, Evgeny Onegin. So in this simple example, we have two states, vowels and consonants, and we can write the transition probability in matrix form. So on the left here, you can see 
your current state and on the upside you can see your next state and so moving from a vowel to a vowel has a 0.175 probability and from a vowel to a consonant a 0.825 and so rows must sum up to one in this kind of notation so this process clearly produces dependent samples since the probability of the next state depends on the current one. We have one set of probabilities when we are on a vowel and another set when we are on a consonant. Now suppose we are starting from some initial distribution pi zero and we follow the transition probability through time. What will happen? Well, under certain conditions, we can converge to the limit probability distribution, which in this case would be 61% consonants and 39% vowels. So this final distribution is called the stationary distribution and it's also known as the limit distribution. Once we reach it, the balance equations hold. What are the balance equations? They simply mean that once you're in this limit distribution, going through the transition matrix again will result in the same distribution. Depending on that transition matrix, there are several possible scenarios. There may be no stationary distribution, there might be infinitely many, or there may be exactly one stationary distribution. For example, consider the identity matrix. Here, every initial distribution is stationary, since the state never change. The case we care about is when there is exactly one unique stationary distribution, and chains with this property are also called ergodic. Ergodicity guarantees both uniqueness of the stationary distribution and converges to it, regardless of where we start. So ergodic implies unique stationary, but stationary does not imply ergodic. Why do we care about ergodic chains? Well, mainly due to the ergodic theorem. The balance equations require us to have a full distribution and then move it one step at a time. But the ergodic theorem instead states that if we follow a single chain, then the relative number of times we spend on each state will converge to the true unique stationary distribution. And here's a graphical illustration of the idea. Imagine we begin with a very large sample from the initial distribution. On the plot here, I show five chains that start at different points in the state space. Ergodicity means that the histogram of a single chain over time is the same as the histograms of all chains in one single time step. So in light green, you see the distribution of all states at time 50, while in light blue, you see the distribution of one chain across time. When ergodicity holds, these two distribution are the same. So what are the conditions for Markov chains to be ergodic? Well, the key requirement is irreducibility the ability of the chain to eventually reach any state from any other state. In other words, the chain can fully explore the state space. In addition, several other conditions are necessary. The chain should be aperiodic, positive recurrent, and typically we also assume time homogeneous. Let's start with time homogeneity. This simply means that the transition probabilities remain fixed over time. Note that non-homogeneous chains can still be ergodic, but the homogeneous case is easier to analyze. Irreducibility means that every state can be reached from any other state, not necessarily in a single step, but in a finite amount of steps. As long as all states are mutually accessible, the chain is irreducible. So for example here, you can see that starting from state A, we cannot move to state C in one step. Yeah, we cannot do this but we can reach it in two steps. We can reach it by going to step B and then from B going to step C. And here below you can see a counterexample. Here the state split into two blocks that are separated from each other, right? And if we start from A or B, we can never go to state C and D, never, and vice versa. If we start in C or D, we are always stuck in C and D. And so this chain is reducible and not irreducible. Again, this doesn't mean that there are no stationary distribution, just that the chain is not ergodic and there's not a unique stationary distribution. Hyperiodicity means that the chain does not get trapped in rigid cycles. In other words, there isn't a fixed rhythm like every two steps that dictates when the chain can return to a single state. Here are some counterexamples. 
In the chain on the left, no matter which state we start from, we can only return after an even number of steps. And on the right, we alternate between state B in one step and in the next step, either states A or C with equal probability. Formally, the period of a state is defined as the greatest common divisor, GCD, of all integers n such that the probability of returning to that state in n steps is positive. A chain is aperiodic if GCD is equal to 1. For the example on the right, if we start from the second state, it is only possible to return in an even number of steps. So its period is 2. Okay, so if we start at B, we can either go 1, 2, or 1, 2, 3, 4, or 1, 2, 3, 4. Yeah, there's many ways, but it has to be 2, 4, 6, etc. And so the greatest common divisor of all these numbers is 2. Now, if a chain is irreducible, then all states share the same period. So to check aperiodicity, it's enough to verify the period of a single state. Now, what is recurrence? Broadly, states in a Markov chain can be either recurrent or transient. A state is recurrent if, starting from it, the chain will return to it with probability 1. And a state is transient if the probability of ever returning is less than 1. A classic example is a simple random walk. In one or two dimensions, this is recurrent, but in three dimensions or higher, it becomes transient. And this is captured beautifully in Japanese-American mathematician Shizu Kakutani's famous line, a drunk man will find his way home, but a drunk bird may get lost forever. Now, among recurrent states, there's also two types. There's the positive recurrent, which means the expected return time is finite, and there's the null recurrent, where the expected return time is infinite. Here's an example of null recurrence random walk in one dimension. No matter what state you start from, you have a probability of 1 to return, but the expected value of the number of steps is infinite. This is why this chain doesn't have a stationary distribution. In a sense, the probability mass extends to infinity. And obviously, recurrence is only a problem when the state space is infinite. If you have a finite space, no matter how big it is, we don't need to worry about it. If the chain is ergodic, it has exactly one stationary distribution. But how do we actually find it? We can use the balance equations. Let's look at an example. Can you determine the stationary distribution of this chain? Pause the video and try for yourself. So what are we actually missing here? What we're missing is, of course, that the sum of the probabilities must be equal to 1. So if we set pi 3, for example, to be equal 1 minus pi 1 and pi 2, we can solve this and get that the stationary distribution is this distribution over here. Now, in addition to the balance equations, there are also the detailed balance equations, which is also known as time reversibility. The equations are that pi i times pi i j is equal to pi j times pj i for every i j. And we can write this also in matrix form, where big pi is the diagonal matrix of pi. And what this means is that the probability of moving between states is symmetric. That is, the probability of being in state i and then moving to state j is the same as the probability of being in state j and then moving to state i. Now, detailed balance also implies balance, and it's sometimes easier to show than the balance equations. And indeed, this is what was proven in the original MCMC papers. Here's an example where detailed balance holds. Notice that this doesn't require p to be symmetric, although if p is symmetric, then detailed balance holds. And so we can see that 0 0.75 times 0, 0.1 is equal to 0 0.25 times 0, 0.3. And below you can see the counterexample from before. Here it doesn't hold, right? Because the probability of being in state A and moving to state B so is one third times 0 0.4. It's not equal to the probability of being in state B times moving to state A. So third times 0 0.6. So here, detailed balance doesn't hold, but we saw that balance does hold, and also this chain is ergodic, and you can check it for yourself. Also, as a reminder, detailed balance, as well as balance, do not imply that the chain is ergodic. So here are two examples. In these chains, if you use uh, the stationary distribution pi, which is the uniform, then detailed balance, as well as balance, holds, but the chains are obviously not ergodic.
So up until now, we looked at discrete state spaces, but the same principles apply also to the continuous state spaces. Instead of pi, we will have some continuous distribution and we can denote its PDF by f of x. Instead of a transition matrix, we'll have a transition kernel denoted by this and also sometimes by this. For example, the transition kernel can be a normal distribution centered at the current state. These are the balance and detailed balance formulations in the case of a probability density function. It's enough to have these density equalities since they immediately imply probabilities for any given set A. And there's also a general measure theory formulation for these equations, which you might stumble uh, when reading papers. And these equations encompass both discrete probabilities, continuous probabilities, and mixed probabilities. And while the dx may look scary, how I interpret it is as the probability of being in a small neighborhood of x. And then, for example, you can interpret the detailed balance as saying the probability of being in a small neighborhood of x times the probability of moving from x to a small neighborhood of x prime. Here are some examples for transition kernels and basically chains. So the normal kernel is not ergodic. It is irreducible and aperiodic, but it's not positive recurrent, meaning there's no stationary distribution. It's essentially a form of random walk. But if we use this form of kernel, then the chain is ergodic and the stationary distribution is given by this distribution here. In fact, this type of chain is known as an AR1 process, an autoregressive process of order one, since it can be seen as a time series model. Okay, before we wrap up, I'm giving you some homework. You can pause the screen, look at the questions here, and maybe post your answers in the comment sections below. That's all for this video. Hope you enjoy it. See you in the next one.